Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Our guest today is Scott Bullock, senior attorney at the Institute for Justice. Uh, approximately 10 years ago, I think in uh, February, uh, February 22nd, I think, is if I remember correctly. I think that might be right. Uh, you uh, argued – I did look it up, so it wasn't just stuck in my <laughs> mind. But, uh, you argued a case in front of the Supreme Court called Kelo versus City of New London, which has become kind of famous. As Supreme Court cases go, uh, it's become relatively famous. Can you tell us what that case was about? Well, the Kelo case uh, was about an attempt by a group of neighbors in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood of New London, Connecticut to try to save their homes. Uh, their homes were sought by the city of New London and a private development corporation that wanted to take them, bulldoze them and turn the uh, – their former neighborhood into a high-end mixed-use development where there was going to be a five-star hotel, luxury condominiums, office space, originally a health club uh, and other private development projects. Uh, when a group of seven of the property owners who owned 15 parcels of property uh, refused to sell uh, to the city, the city invoked its eminent domain power to take those properties uh, to hand over to a private developer in the name of economic development. And eminent domain is uh, – for our listeners not familiar with that. Sure. Eminent domain is a longstanding power of the government. Uh, it has been called from the earliest days of, of America the despotic power of government because it is one of the most serious and threatening things a government can do to its citizens, short of taking your life or maybe throwing you in jail, to take away your home, your business, your land, uh, is about as, as potentially draconian as it gets. So in the U.S. Constitution and virtually every other state constitution, the framers were so concerned about abuse of that power that they put important limitations on it. And that's in the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation, placing two important limits on the eminent domain power. If the government takes your property, they have to pay you for it. I mean, there's a whole dispute about what constitutes just comp uh, compensation. But the more fundamental limitation is that the government can take your property, can only take your property if it is for a public use. And most people know what that is. Um, that's a road, a bridge, a public building, uh, sometimes public utilities, something that either the public owns or that everybody has a right to use. Members of the public have a right to use. But over the past 50 or 60 years at the Supreme Court and in many states, that clause, that public use requirement has been watered down uh, and it led to the Kelo case where public use was transformed uh, in the Berman case in the 1950s and in the 1980s into public purpose. And then eventually in the Kelo decision from 2005, the Supreme Court said, well, let's read that to mean public benefit. And what are the public benefits? Well, it was supposedly going to be more tax revenue and more jobs created by, uh, the, uh, by the new development project in New London. I guess what's wrong with that in the <laughs> sense that I mean the, the – broadly speaking, taking some property from some people in order to benefit – other people is or people in general is what I mean is is like more or less everything that our government does right I mean that's you know healthcare subsidies are taking some money from some people to give it to others we do it all the time so what's What's well, wrong with taking someone's house to turn it into tax dollars? Right. Well, the most important thing – I mean the, all those <laughs> you could question as well uh, and that might be even be a, a broader di uh, discussion as to what constitutional limits there are on federal and state governments beyond the, the public use provision. But this is – an absolutely an essential part of the Constitution. It's in the text of the Constitution that says that property can only be taken for public use, which almost by its very definition disqualifies what was really going on here, which was private use. Uh, that is what happened in the Kelo cases, that they were taking land from one private owner and turning it over to, uh, to another uh, private owner in the hope that that new private owner would produce more tax revenue. 
And that's just textually contrary to the Constitution. Um, and it is something too that it's a view of, em of eminent uh, domain without really any sort of limitation whatsoever. And that was the real problem with the Kelo decision. It's any piece of property would produce more tax revenue and more jobs if it were a business. Um, because all the government has to do is – we can talk about what happened in the aftermath of the Kelo case – is project that this new project will create X number of jobs and X number of tax uh, – X amount of tax revenue. And somebody could always come up with a higher and better use of your property than you were making it. And that was the real danger in the Kelo – is still the real danger in the Kelo decision and that's what we were asking the Supreme Court to do was to pl at least place some outer limits on the eminent domain power. That seems particularly dangerous for poor people. Well, that's the – one of the big problems with eminent domain. I mean there are so many but one of the big ones is that this unquestionably falls hardest on the poor uh, and minority groups as well. That's been historically true and it's true up to this day uh, as well. I mean a domain is typically targeted at neighborhoods that um, are longstanding neighborhoods. Uh, there might be a lot of elderly folks there, or poor individuals and cities want to do it because – they have the lure of more tax dollars. Developers love it because they don't have to sit down and negotiate one-on-one uh, -on -one with, uh, with property owners the way thankfully most land deals are, are, are done in this country. So it really turned into this unholy alliance between big developers, big businesses like big box retail stores and local governments desperate for tax revenue and it, it falls hardest to this day on those um, – on, on the poorest individuals in society. When we hear about these kinds of just on their face absurd actions by government like we're going to steal someone's house and give it to this rich guy, I'm always curious about the the motivations or the thinking of the public officials involved. I mean, were were they it's it's easy to picture them as like you know, sitting in a, a dark, smoke-filled room with you know these That's business leaders and, them, yeah. and like saying, "Yes, this is this is vile, but we're going to do it because we want to scratch your back, and then you'll give me money or a job when I get out of office." But is that really how it looks, or do they think that they're actually doing something in the public good? It's it's a great question, and the, one of the problems with having this in court and, and allowing these types of takings to take place is that it's very difficult to get into the minds of the folks that are making these decisions. Uh, typically in court, you don't have the smoking gun moment, the Jack Nicholson versus Tom Cruise moment in the courtroom where you have a breakdown and you get a city official to say, you're right, I did it all for Pfizer, I did it all for Costco. It typically doesn't happen. Um, that's what you dream about at night. Exactly. Yeah, so you could dream about it, but usually it doesn't happen that way. And so what you're left with is kind of scant evidence about what's uh, about what they're doing. Oftentimes you have city officials that, like what happened in New London, molding their development plans exactly to what a private company wanted. Um, but I think for most city officials, there's mixed motivations as the way a lot of people behave, that they – doing the bidding of a certain company but they ultimately think, well, yes, it's going to be good for them but it will also be good for our city. And that was the approach I think in New London. They thought what is good for Pfizer is good for New London. So you had a lot of mixed motivations trying to – and trying to separate that out is very difficult to do. But I, I'll make one other point about this though too is that what I think was the – one of the real – problems and frankly tragedies in the majority uh, opinion is they had a very pristine view of how municipal decision making is done <laughs> where they think that well – and they and Justice Stevens in his majority opinion talked a lot about the planning process that the city went through and they had studies and they listened to everybody and they got approvals from various agencies step by step and he thought, well, this is you – know, this is really impressive. And then you had somebody like Justice O'Connor who wrote um, the dissenting opinion, a very passionate opinion and I, what I would call a very real world opinion as well. And she had been an elected official. Exactly right because that's something where you know, debate is good to have political officials or elected officials on, uh, on the Supreme Court. I think in something like this, it was a real benefit certainly to her opinion. Being a state official, 
She knows how these deals go down. Usually they're decided before the public hearings and most of the kind of approvals that they go through are dog and pony shows because all the very important people got together in town and wired it from the get-go. And I think she saw that in a way that many members of the Supreme Court who I don't even know when the last time they ever attended a city council meeting <laughs> uh, did not really understand. So going back as you kind of mentioned the story a little bit but but the interesting thing on these cases especially from you as a litigator side and also what the Institute for Justice does generally is how did you find – uh, Suzette Kilo. How, what, what happened in the beginning when you first got your hands dirty? When did you? How did you bring it up through the case? I mean, the whole. You know, how did you bring it up to the courts? When did you start thinking maybe we could bring the Supreme Court? Did that ever hit you, or is it just always a surprise? Kind of. Well, absolutely. I mean, from the very beginning of our cases, we uh, designed them to try to maximize the ability uh, uh, for us and for the clients to win the case but then also to set a long-term precedent that will benefit other property owners, other Americans that find themselves in similar situations. So we're always looking for those cases that present those opportunities for a cutting-edge legal issue, um, sympathetic clients, outrageous facts and quite frankly evil villains uh, uh, then as well. And there was no uh, shortage of those in, New Lond in the New London case or in any eminent domain case that we've ever been uh, involved in. So now, were you guys keeping an eye out too on the public use part of the – of the Fifth Amendment? To Absolutely. I mean that was – we got involved in this in the mid-90s and our goal as a public interest organization was try to change the law in this area. We thought it was an essential part of the constitution. It was something that was clearly um, uh, being ignored and, um, and courts for a long time were just rubber stamping whatever governments wanted to do in this area. And so we set out with a long-term mission of fundamentally changing the law and changing the, court, uh, the climate of public opinion to make these sorts of takings unacceptable. So we were looking for cases that would further that uh, agenda and also challenging uh, the outer limits of eminent domain. We also – one of the areas that uh, we were looking at is so-called blight cases and that stems from a lot of the cases in the 1950s where governments declared certain areas blighted and used that as an excuse for taking uh, property and we wanted to challenge that. But then governments were also uh, just taking land because they said – like in New London, we need more tax revenue, more jobs, more economic growth. That's a good enough justification. That's what they were doing in New London and that's one of the reasons why we picked it. It came to our attention uh, uh, by one of the local activists in the area writing me a letter and uh, I read it and said, this sounds outrageous and, uh, and I called him up, gathered more information and then I traveled up to New London and met the uh, the folks uh, there and uh, brought in uh, other colleagues at uh, the Institute for Justice, in particular uh, Dana Berliner who was a co-counsel uh, with me on, on, on this case and that uh, – we decided that this would make a fantastic vehicle for – uh, both challenging the use of eminent domain for economic development purposes and also trying to save these people's homes. And there's even more to, to Suzette Kilo's story about her house and how she bought it and and her life beforehand. Yeah, I mean it was it was a really an, an amazing story of people who were really tied to their property and it was for different reasons. You know, up the street from Suzette Kilo was the Derry family. They had lived in New London uh, in Fort Trumbull since 1905. Wow. Uh, Wilhelmina Derry uh, lived in one of the homes. She was born in that home in 1918, had never lived anywhere else and she was in her 80s when the case started. She wanted to die in the home that she had lived in. She got married in the 1940s. Her husband uh, moved in there with her. Uh, her son and his family lived right next door. They owned two smaller homes on this nice little uh, smaller parcel of land that other family members lived in and sometimes they would rent them out. So their ties to the community were very deep and their ties to this property were extremely deep and that meant so much to them. Suze Kilo was in a different boat. She had – uh, had actually a pretty rough life um, growing up. She was very poor. She grew up in Maine. Um, she um, got pregnant when she was 16 years old. Um, she got married shortly after that. She had and raised five children before she was 40. And uh, she was trapped in a in a uh, kind of a, uh, a a marriage that was problematic. And so, about around the age of 40, she decided that. 
I'm going to start out on my own. And she went to school. She became an, uh, an emergency medical technician, then eventually went to school to become a nurse. And she said, I want to have a place of my own. I've never owned a piece of property in my entire life. And so she found this little place when she was out on an ambulance run in Fort Trumbull that was run down. Uh, the house was. It hadn't been lived in for I think over a year. Um, but she looked at it, looked at the view of the Thames River out onto the Long Island Sound and said, this is going to be mine. And that it was just a great demonstration of the importance of property rights to a broad range of people, especially those who have never owned anything really in their entire lives. Um, and a year after she had bought it, fixed it up, painted it her favorite color of pink or she would call it salmon uh, <laughs> and, uh, and moved in, there was a knock on the door from the real estate agent telling her that they wanted her house and if she didn't sell, they were going to use them in a domain against him. And when you started looking into – so the first thing was to you know, your standard file, file a suit or file a claim and then ask for discovery and start looking into the documents about who was behind this. And there's a little bit of Pfizer involvement and all of these different things and did it just keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper for you? Yeah. I mean it was it, – we, we did a deep dive in, into the documents and uh, as we were able to demonstrate in court too that um, the uh, – I think as Justice Thomas put it in his dissent in Kelo that the development plan was suspiciously amenable to the Pfizer Corporation and what they wanted in their development plan as well. They told the city we'd like to have a five-star luxury hotel for our employees and guests. We'd like to have private office space. We'd like to have a health club. We'd like to have uh, condominiums for scientists that might be working in our uh, facility for you know six months or a year, something like that. And lo and behold, the development plan had a luxury hotel, private office space, uh, condominiums, and 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 so forth. Um, so, but again, it's hard to separate out what was their true motivation for doing this. And again, it was probably a combination of wanting to, of course, benefit Pfizer, which was seen as their economic savior, and thinking, and maybe even believing, or at least certainly justifying to themselves that this was going to be for the good of all the citizens of New London. You've told a story of a very sympathetic woman who went through hardships and this gross unfairness was done to her by the city. But you're an attorney whose job is to advocate for your client and so is we – can, we can have – of course you're going to present her sympathetically. But is, is it possible that said we could look at it like here's a woman who if she were just willing to move – would create all of this – by doing that, she'd create all this good for the community around her. I mean these hotels and health centers and facilities, this is enormous amounts of jobs. This could like completely turn around a town, you know, give it a bright future and here she is. She just – she won't. I mean, they're gonna they're gonna compensate her. Like, why won't she just move? It's the holdout problem, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and this is something that you know. The, of course, the other side had, had tried to make that point, but they could not make it with a straight face. And I've never seen a case really in the e economic development context where you can make this argument in a serious sort of way. The interesting thing about the about Suzette Kilo and her other neighbors is that they weren't NIMBY people. You know, they were not really – their goal was not to say we don't want anything new in our neighborhood. We want it to be exactly the same way. They said, listen, we want to be a part of this. You know, is the Fort Trumbull neighborhood – has it had better times? Absolutely. Is the city of New London suffering economically? Sure it is. They knew that. But they wanted to really be a part of this uh, too. You know, they said, listen, you have a lot of other land. I mean this was a 90-acre uh, project and the uh, the properties amounted to a little bit more than 1.5 acres of property and they were confined to two separate areas. So you had these vast swaths of property and guess what? They wanted to do a mixed use development in this neighborhood too. They wanted to have homes there, at least at least condominiums, residential and offices and that sort of thing. So they were saying, listen, you know, let us keep what we have. It's so important to us. Um, and, and let us be a part of any economic revitalization that occurs. I mean, one of the outrageous things about it, they didn't get too much attention during the case, um, and it wasn't. It was a, it was an issue in the lower courts, but not at the Supreme Court. Is that um, the city and the New London Development Corporation uh, said everybody has to go. The whole neighborhood has to be cleaned out. Well, there happened to be a very popular private 
men's social club located in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood called the Italian Dramatic Club. And when – and this is a gathering spot for – prominent people in New London and political leaders, every time they came to New London and Connecticut and elsewhere, they would always meet at the, at, at the dramatic club. And when the those uh, powers that be found out that the, the Italian dramatic club was going to be torn down, they said, well, this is outrageous. We have to save the dramatic club. And lo and behold, the New London Development Corporation found a way – to save the Italian Dramatic Club as a part of the overall uh, development plan, even though the plan did not call at all for a social club, certainly not an exclusive private men's only social club as well. It caused Matt Derry, whose family was Italian and lived in the neighborhood for years to quip that um, their, the approach of the city was that um, the Italian Dramatic Club can stay, just all the Italians have to leave. <laughs> now, the Dramatic Club, though, I think we maybe missed the uh, the key here because that is the smoke-filled room where they planned it all, I imagine. No question. They, well, they certainly I, – I, I'm convinced that they, they made the plans to save the club in in the smoke-filled <laughs> dramatic club. So how did the lower courts rule on this? Well, lower courts, it was very divided. Um, that we got a – I think it was about a 150-page decision from the uh, trial judge in New London. We had a seven-day trial in New London and there was a – it was really a split the baby uh, type of decision. There were two parcels that I had mentioned uh, where the homes were located and he said – the one where four homes were located could be taken because he agreed that economic development was a public use. But where Suzette Kilo's home was and the dairy homes and, and actually most of the – 11 of the homes were, he said it was unconstitutional to take them because the city had no idea what it was going to do with this parcel. They had no development plans really in place. They said it was going to be – it could be – Parking, it could be retail, it could be something known as park support, which nobody really even knew what that really was except for the fact that there was a park located across the street from it. And they said you just, his ruling was you can't take people's homes without at least having some idea as to what is going to happen with it. How can you determine whether the takings are necessary, whether it's for a public use? So that was a split decision that went up to the Connecticut Supreme Court. The Connecticut Supreme Court in a four to three decision reversed uh, – well, reversed in, in, in against the property owners uh, on all counts. And so they said it was a public use and then reversed the ruling of the uh, judge with regards to where Suzette Kilo's home was saying, well, who cares if they have done don't have any specific plans for this. And that was actually part of you had to file in state court first. This is a little bit of like right. legal mumbo jumbo maybe, but it's an important point, something where we're, we're trying to fight because you had to deal with the exhaustion of in state court, correct? With the Williamson County type yeah, of precedent. It, it, exactly. And it was just because they had filed it, Connecticut's a little odd because they um, they had filed them in the domain actions in state court and then um, you uh, you have to file a lawsuit in Connecticut in state court to raise the the constitution issues and, and others. And so, yeah, all, a vast majority of, of eminent domain decisions come from the state courts. We did raise federal constitutional arguments in addition to state constitutional arguments and that's what allowed us then to get up to, the, uh, up, uh, up to the Supreme Court uh, uh, then as well. The Connecticut Supreme Court, the, the dissenters in that case um, wrote a very, uh, uh, very prescient dissent where they uh, complained about the lack of uh, detail or plans in the area, and even calling their approach a field of dreams approach where it wasn't if you build something, uh, people will come, but if you tear everything down, then you hope that people uh, and then you hope that people will come to uh, uh, to new london and uh, and that issue wasn 't really the Supreme Court really didn 't care about that, but as you know as you might mention as we can discuss. Uh, what happened in the wake of the Kelo decision, uh, that dissent really, uh, as I said, was uh, prophetic in it's, what had happened. It's currently empty. I mean, at last I checked, I, I haven't checked recently. But there is no new development in the Fort Trumbull neighborhood whatsoever. Now, 10 years after the Supreme Court's decision was handed down, 15 years since the development plan was approved, 17 years since the uh, uh, project was first discussed, there is 
no development in Fort Trumbull. The uh, place is a barren field. It is sometimes used as a dump for storm debris when serious storms move through there. There is a nice fer- uh, colony of feral cats that live in, uh, in, in, in Fort Trumbull. So they benefit. Uh, yeah, yes. exactly. They have new homes uh, 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 for themselves. Uh, and the uh, all the homes are gone, and the city has absolutely nothing to show for this. No new tax revenue has been produced. And Pfizer, who was supposed to be the savior of New London, was the linchpin of this whole project. In I believe it was 2009, announced and the Pfizer facility was next door to Fort Trumbull. It wasn't actually um, the, uh, the takings were not for the Pfizer facility itself. It was next door. In 2009, Pfizer announced that it was closing its New London facility and leaving New London just as its tax abatements were expiring. Now, if I recall correctly, was it? One of the majority in the Connecticut Supreme Court decision who later apologized to Sekilo in person when he when he met her. That's right, and um, I, that was uh, that that did occur. And he said that you know if I would have known then what I know now, and this was several years after the opinion and the outrage and the backlash and the and the lack of development uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, then he said uh, he would have ruled in a different. Way too late, unfortunately, for the uh, folks in in New London um, and in the, the Fort Trumbull neighborhood. But the great legacy that they've left is that the fact that they waged this battle, that they stood up for their rights, and in the process have made a re- very serious um, transformation of the law in on eminent domain, where you've had very serious changes to the law because of the backlash and outrage that occurred as a result of the Kelo decision and the fight that they that they waged. So that was a great legacy for the Fort Trumbull property owners to have, even though they themselves lost their homes. Um, homeowners in many states are much better protected as a result of their fight. The Supreme Court ultimately ruled against Suzette Kilo. And I'm wondering, did – based on – I mean in the in the oral argument, did you know then that it was lost? Well, actually, or, first of all, did you go up on, on – on appeal, did you were you losing when you went up, or did you want? Yeah, we we lost. We lost four to three at the Connecticut Supreme Court. But the issue was framed very well. That you know the dissent had talked about how the Supreme Court had not really addressed this issue, and you know it had really framed a lot of uh, state Supreme Courts had come to differing conclusions on it. So um, it was it was a it was a the time was right uh, for it. There was growing public awareness and and concern about this um, a year ago to the day that the uh, Supreme Court agreed to accept Kelo. There was this uh, big piece on 60 Minutes that Mike Wallace did, which is kind of an expose of, uh, of, of eminent domain abuse. Uh, and that, I think, really raised for the first uh, time the issue to national level that got so many people's uh, attention. And then we got up to the to the Supreme Court. And to answer your question, I, I, I thought it was going to be 5-4, but I just did not know which way it was going to go uh, because the questions were kind of all over the map. There were two justices that weren't there. Justice Rehnquist was uh, sick at the time and so he wasn't there. And Justice Stevens, ironically enough, who wrote the opinion, uh, had missed his flight from Florida coming back to the Supreme Court after the break right before President's Day and wasn't able to attend the argument. So I didn't know where he was going to stand on this issue. And there was a lot of justices that seemed like Justice Breyer, for instance, looking for some type of middle ground um, between um, saying that there was no uh, – economic development could never be a public use but maybe it could not be a public use in certain instances. So um, I thought maybe it could be a very fractured decision where um, the, you know, it would be hard to even find what the rule of law might be on this because it would be divided depending on how far the court was was willing uh, to go. So I thought it was going to be very close, 5-4. Uh, I was, of course, hoping for 5-4 in favor of Suzette and, and her neighbors, but it went exactly the, uh, the other way. The one frustrating thing, um, I think the most frustrating thing for us and, and certainly for me in arguing the case is that um, – I, I, Justice Kennedy just did not seem very sympathetic to our arguments and that proved to be true uh, because he ultimately uh, was the fifth vote uh, on the uh, on the court 
and I just didn't understand why that was the case. He had been a pretty strong advocate for property rights. Uh, he had written in a, in a case, a forfeiture case actually in the early uh, 1990s um, that individual freedom finds tangible expression in property rights. And he just did not seem to be very sympathetic. And that was surprising and, of course, very concerning to us. And the day that the decision came out, obviously, first a ton of disappointment, um, but, but then an immediate new plan to – or it had already been discussed, I'm sure, too. We have new st- – we, we, our quiver is not empty. We have new things to do. Absolutely. And you know, that's one of the great things about public interest law is that if you lose, you don't just say, well – we lost. We move on to something else. We were determined to take this loss and turn it into a victory in the other areas in which uh, we both litigate in state courts um, and uh, also through public awareness and um, grassroots activism and legislative efforts uh, as well. So you're right. We put together a, uh, a plan uh, within a week's time. Uh, we devoted significant resources both uh, with P- our people and, and, and financially uh, to it and we were going to take what was a genuine outrage about this decision and turn it into something productive as well. And that was something that you know, when I read especially Justice O'Connor's dissent and how fiery it was and how passionate it was. It wasn't a you know, very measured Justice O'Connor dissent. It was clear that she was upset about this and she wrote it in a way that was going to get a lot of people's attention. And you, you know, I would be walking down the street you know, and I'd hear people talking about it. Jay Leno, you know, the night of the decision, asked Arnold Schwarzenegger about it. And people just thought, how could this possibly take place? You know, how could the Supreme Court do this? The polling on it was off the charts. It didn't matter you know, what political party you were in or where you lived in the country. We thought this was a real opportunity to try to change the law. Do you see anything going forward of that precedent possibly being shaky? Or is IJ pursuing, pursuing anything making – it might be a little shaky now possibly? Well, sure. I mean you know, the, the backlash was significant. It wasn't um, – you know, there were certain problems with the, the legislation. You know, um, now if you count both state Supreme Court decisions and uh, legislative and constitutional changes, 47 states have changed their law in some ways and about half of those states, they're – excellent protections. They basically shut down eminent domain abuse, not just the Kelo-style takings, but a lot of states went even further and changed their blight laws that we were talking about, which is even more than we would have gotten out of a positive decision in Kelo, which was which was fantastic. The other – about half of them though, they were watered down versions of it. Um, uh, developers and, and, and uh, legislators were able to take out some of the strongest provisions. They're better than what they were before, not in every state, but, but in, in most instances. Some of them are vague and haven't been interpreted so you don't know what they really what they really mean. Um, but we are concerned that 10 years out from now, even though we've seen these sweeping changes and we've been very encouraged by that, that, um, that you're going to see pressure to change back the law. And, um, and we're already starting to see that. We have some cases now that we're involved in that we're looking into because memories fade. Uh, and and you know the commercial real estate market starting to come back now too. That was another thing that factored into the decline is that um, the commercial real estate market had tanked, and so there wasn't much need for these types of uh, for these types of takings. As that comes back, you're going to see I think efforts to yeah. weaken the laws and and cities and developers once again talking about the need to do this. So ten years after Kilo. Um, IJ is now dealing with another form of. The government taking people's property. Although I think um, that they've been dealing with the whole time, but we're going to switch yes, gears a little yes, bit here. You know, this is this uh, Aaron's transition question, but <laughs> yes. it's, it's working. It's okay. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. And 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 it happens to be one that's in the news a lot right now, which is civil asset forfeiture. Yes, that was something that you know we've been involved in uh, certainly uh, uh, for uh, a few years. But our intent really was to take this issue um, sort of like what we did with eminent domain. What we really do with all of our issues but especially uh, I think the analogy is very appropriate for the eminent domain context. When we first got involved in this in the mid-1990s, very few people had heard about this. Most people were not aware that the government could take your home and give it to Costco or take a business and give it to a, 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 a condominium developer and we started a – long-term project to try to change the law, raise awareness about this and get the, the public up to speed on this and get 
courts more involved in this. And that's exactly what we wanted to do with civil forfeiture uh, as well, to take an issue that most people, probably even fewer people had heard about this power than they had heard about eminent domain. Some people have this idea, oh, yeah, eminent domain is that when they, they take your property to build a road. Most people have no idea that under civil forfeiture laws, the government can take your property in order to buy a uh, margarita. margarita. Yeah, right, exactly. Yes. <laughs> and and they can take your property regardless of whether you have been convicted or even charged with a crime. And then law enforcement gets to keep that property to buy better equipment, go to law enforcement conventions, buy football tickets or even in certain instances to buy margarita machines. So I'm going to ask you to step back here and, 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 and uh, do a little role playing uh, with me because oh it's so absurd. It is, it is so absurd, um, the civil asset forfeiture stuff. But – I, I can imagine a listener being like, it can't be that simple. Um, so, so now you're a, a cop or you're an advocate on the other side and you're explaining how important civil asset forfeiture is. So what are, the, what are these arguments of like why they need to be doing this? Sure. Well, I mean they're going to say it's used to stop crime. It's, it helps us catch the bad guys, that um, it's necessary to fight the war on drugs or you know, fight the war against uh, financial fraud or, or environmental uh, crimes or any number of things uh, for it. Is um, that not true, do you think? Well, it, it's, it is, of course, effective in some ways for law enforcement because it's very easy for them to obtain property. Um, what they leave out of that equation is the fact that in America, you cannot have an ends justifies the means approach to law enforcement or really to any type of government uh, activity. I would argue that civil forfeiture, in fact, is not effective even in stopping those uh, 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 crimes because um, when you ha uh, have civil forfeiture laws the way they are now, where law enforcement gets to keep all or most of their proceeds, you see very perverse law enforcement decisions. For instance, say if you're a proponent of the drug war uh, and you think the, uh, the government should be fighting the war on drugs, stopping uh, the, the dealing of drugs. What you'll find out is under civil forfeiture laws, there are certain highways in the country that are known as drug corridors and there's a lot of uh, places, especially inter uh, interstates that are long and crisscross the country. You'll find that law enforcement does stings on these highways. Well, studies have shown that on these highways, there's one side of the highway is called the drug side of the highway. The other is the money side of the highway. So the drugs come in typically on the east coast. The cars are loaded – or on the west coast and it's distributed out there. They're loaded up and they're then distributed throughout the country and then when the dealers come back, they are uh, coming back through there and that's the money side of the highway. They have all of their cash. Well, guess what? side of the highway the cops overwhelmingly favor when doing sting operations. Oh, let me think. <laughs> think about that if you want to role play about that. So it's in a lot of the places that looked at this, 90 percent of them on the money side of the highway. And, and so even if you are concerned and you think that the government should be fighting the drug war, it shows that what they're really – what these laws are really about is – revenue raising and trying to get uh, money. So you're coming back in on the money side of the highway. You're driving in a car. Uh, you just get pulled over. You don't really know why. Let's just say you have $10,000 in your car uh, because you're going to uh, give your dad and he needs a down payment on a, a new thing. And so you, you withdrew $10,000 and you get stopped. Uh, how can they possibly take this? What is the procedure here? A, a typical question that most people encounter now if they are pulled over and especially if you meet a certain profile, um, you know, it could be a rental car, it could be an out, out-of-state car. Um, it might be how you were driving or, or sometimes Possibly even though race. they're not supposed to do it, ethnicity or race. Um, some of the questions they'll ask you, and most people have encountered it. Do you know why I pulled you over? Do you have your driver's license? Do you have insurance? And then a new question that's being asked much more frequently is, are you carrying any large amounts of cash on you today? Now, how is that an appropriate question in, in America? Who cares whether or not you're carrying a large amount of cash on you? But this has become standard fare for law enforcement to do when – especially when you're pulled over on an interstate. And the reason for that is because they are looking for cash and under civil forfeiture laws, they can seize the currency regardless of whether they have found any sort of illegal activity in your car. So they could seize your currency 
even if you have no drugs on you, if you don't have any warrants out for your arrest, if you have no other problems whatsoever, they could say this is a, is a suspiciously a large amount of cash. We think you might be dealing drugs. We think you might be laundering money. So therefore, we're going to seize it. And under civil forfeiture laws, the burden then switches to you to try to get your property back and you wage a civil litigation with the government where the name of the case is something like United States of America versus $6,400 in US currency. So it's quite literally true that the, the, the presumption of innocence uh, usually we have in, in these cases flips, flips away from you and now you have to prove your, prove your innocence as soon as the officer – is suspicious. Absolutely, they, that's, they, it. They, that's they can all do, it takes. It's probable cause, um, and it, it, to seize the to seize the currency, and then the government merely has to show a preponderance by preponderance of the evidence some it's a connection between the property and illegal activity, and then which is a very light burden to meet. And then the gov then the burden switches to the property owner in forty four states and at the federal uh, government uh, under the federal standard. The burden then switches to you to prove your innocence rather than for the government to prove your guilt. But really, who's driving around with large sums of money in their car unless it's drugs or money laundering? I mean, Trevor mentioned you're you're going to give your dad a down payment, so you withdraw ten thousand dollars. But who's going to hand him a bag of cash if it's if it's legitimate? You'll give him a check or a money order or, or something PayPal. like that. Yeah. But but the whole point, I mean, the lots of cash just screams like I don't want anyone to know about this. Sure. Stuff. Well, I mean, that's true in some instances, of course. You know, some people that are up to no good deal in cash. But there's a lot of legitimate reasons that people have cash. Some people, um, that's the way they've always done it. Um, some people get insurance uh, payments. Some people um, purchase certain things in the in the. And the, if you're buying uh, from somebody, you know, online, they don't want to deal with checks; they want cash. That's a way of of doing it. It's often a cultural thing uh, too, where certain um, cultures still love dealing in cash, and it's very common for them uh, to do so. And it's also, again, getting back with what happens with them in the domain, is it something that poor people do and people who don't have bank accounts and people who can't get bank accounts and um, they oftentimes will have cash on them uh, too for legitimate reasons. Um, but that you know, doesn't stop the government and, and, and law enforcement from, uh, uh, from taking it. You know, the thing is there is an alternative to this and this is what law enforcement doesn't want to talk about is they go say, well, you know, then we can't take people people's property. We can't, we'll let people benefit from their illegal activity. But there is something called criminal forfeiture and criminal forfeiture is tied to someone being convicted of a crime and the government showing that the property was the result of that illegal activity, demonstrating it in court the same way you have to to deprive somebody of their liberty. You should have to do that with depriving somebody of their property as well. Now, is that more burdensome for the government? Of course. Uh, that's what freedom means. <laughs> that's right. That's that's why we have a constitution. Is the government has to meet certain has to meet certain standards. So in all those instances, there's the the prospect of criminal forfeiture that would allow the government still to stop people from laundering money or, or dealing drugs or uh, or some other nefarious purpose, and also like something like financial crimes as well. You know, obviously, um, you know, if somebody's defrauded investors out of millions of dollars and then bought. Properties with all of that money, yeah, you you don't want the person to you know then be able to still keep their property if you show that this is because they stole money from people. Bernie, sure, you could Bernie take Madoff, that. yeah, Bernie Madoff, you know, some, uh, somebody in, in in that camp, but that's criminal forfeiture, not civil forfeiture. But civil forfeiture is preferred because there's money available and the burden is so much lighter. One of the weirder things about the civil asset forfeiture is the fact that the cops get to keep the money, which seems – I mean it would be one thing if it was you – know, so they, they seize your drugs. Um, then they have to put those in a locker somewhere, destroy them. They don't turn around and resell them or use them themselves or whatever. Um, and so why – when do they get to spend this money? Yeah. Because um, it's – you know, they could – you could make a case for they take it. They think it's suspicious. They're going to hold on for a while and if there isn't a case against you, they give it back. 
Um, but do they – is there some timeline there? Can they spend it immediately? Do they have to hold it for a certain yeah, amount of time? Yeah, they typically can't spend it immediately. They can use it oftentimes. If it's a car or something they can use, uh, they, they can actually hold on to it and, and oftentimes use it. And these uh, would be the it. cards you see that say like I got – it could be the cards that say I got this from a drug dealer or something. Right. That's usually after it's been – I mean one of the numerous problems with civil forfeiture is the fact that because it's a civil proceeding, the government can just – File a claim against the, give you a notice, and then file a forfeiture action, not against you, but against the property. And if you don't come in and defend yourself in civil litigation with the government, then the government can win by default. So if you miss the deadline, or you don't know how to do this, or you can't afford a lawyer to fight it, or you think this is just too much, I don't want to deal with this, the government can just get a default judgment against you and then the property automatically becomes theirs and then they can spend it under the broad rubric of law enforcement. Uh, so typically they have to wait some period of time before they're able they're able to spend it but then they can spend it as they see fit. And that was really the fundamental transformation of forfeiture law. And this happened in the mid 1980s at the federal level, a lot of states followed suit with that before 1984 um, and uh, it went into effect in 1985. But before 1984, at the federal level, forfeiture revenue went into the Treasury's general fund. That was changed in the mid-1980s to give a financial incentive directly to law enforcement. And they said, we get to keep everything that we seize. And another quiz, Trevor, guess what happened as soon as that law <laughs> was changed? Did civil <laughs> forfeiture revenue go up or did it go down? It not only went up but it skyrocketed in use and it has exponentially increased every year since that occurred and that's why they're doing this. It's not about fighting crime. It's about raising money. Trevor Burrus Well, we've seen some of this. I mean I can imagine a police officer with this incentive who is an unsavory person, especially if it's like $10,000. $10,000 is about what a lawyer would probably cost you to, to – I mean it's right on the edge of whether or not it's worth fighting. So they say we're going to take $10,000 and we're going to keep it. There's of course this video that went around of the uh, – of the police officers talking about the musical gear. Did you see this one? Yes, yeah, absolutely. About who, right. gets, who gets the drum because they raided a music studio and they found some marijuana. I said, who gets the drum set? I think Bob's kid wants a new guitar. I mean literally that level yeah. of, of piracy essentially. Right. And, and, and you know, this is our, our point in this we, wanna, we like to emphasize over and, over and over again is that this is not a case of a couple of rogue cops or prosecutors that are doing this. This is a problem with the system itself. It's about the incentives. You know, every economist will tell you as I'm sure you've interviewed numerous, that incentives matter um, and that's true for no matter who you are. And if you give people the wrong incentives, it's not surprising that you're going to see law enforcement uh, behavior skew in the way that's going to uh, favor what opportunities do we have to make money rather than thinking about how are we going to fairly enforce the law today and, and, and let's think about which uh, cases should uh, – or crime should be, should be a priority. So that's the inevitable result, the behavior that you were talking about in that video and several others of giving people the exact wrong incentives. And it's just incredible going back and looking when these laws were passed. Everybody thought that this was – a great idea. This would be wonderful. You know, we'll let the you know the drug dealers and others will have to pay. You know, they 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 have to have pay to for their the own enforcement. Exactly. You know, and, and nobody thought about, or very few people, it seems like, thought about the unintended consequences of doing this. But we've seen it play out now over a thirty-year period. And now you had another case where the incentives were interesting in the last couple of years. They got some news too uh, about a motel. Yes. That was was interestingly owned free and clear, uh, and and had a the case is this is an idea for a list of what they're called United States versus four thirty four Main Street Tewksbury Massachusetts. Uh, can you tell us a little bit what that case? Sure. Is? That, well, that was a case that just summarized everything that is wrong with civil forfeiture laws. It was a case filed against the property rather than the property owner, and it was a case that was brought about because a DEA agent was looking for forfeiture opportunities online and he Wait, saw – Is there a clearinghouse for these? How do you possibly it? do this? They, they were well, – they, he was looking online at, at crime reports and news stories and that sort of thing and he saw news and read accounts of the Motel Caswell in Tewksbury, Massachusetts, which is a budget motel. It's been in the Caswell family. That's who the owners of the property were, although they were just – 
sort of interveners in the case, uh, Russ Caswell and his family. Um, it, it had been in the Caswell family since the 1950s. Uh, Russ bought it from his father in the early 1980s and his family has run it. And shockingly enough, at a budget motel, there was occasionally drug activity occurred at the motel in addition to fights and drunkenness. But of course, that happens at budget places. These very crimes also occur at the Ritz-Carlton, at, at the Four Seasons and other types of, uh, of, of accommodations as well. But they certainly occur and probably more frequently at a budget place like the Motel Caswell. There was no allegation whatsoever that Mr. Caswell or his family was involved in any of these crimes. Uh, the record showed that Mr. Caswell did what he could to try to put a stop to it. When the police asked him to cooperate with them, he always did, including the cops saying, hey, we think somebody's dealing drugs out of one of the rooms at the motel. We'd like to do some surveillance. And Russ said, sure, why don't you just take a room for free next door to that room to do so? So this was kind of his level of involvement in this. But under civil forfeiture laws, it did not matter. It was – the property was involved in illegal activity. So the federal government teamed up with the local police department. And they filed a forfeiture action. The US Attorney's Office did so in Boston and Russ stood to lose his entire motel because of the actions of independent third parties, his guests who he had no control over uh, whatsoever. And so then th that led to a, a showdown in, in federal court in Boston. Are there limits to – I mean this, so this case um, you won but before that, were there limits to like the size of the property? I'm wondering because so like this – in this case you can steal a whole hotel because one room was used for drugs. So if I owned like thousands of acres of farmland and some guy trekked across it to sell drugs to someone else, could – they come along and take all my farm. Well, like they, they could certainly make that argument, um, and there have been cases. A couple things uh, that has happened, and one of the good things that we were able to establish in um, in uh, the Caswell case is that the law was changed back in two thousand at the federal level to add language that said there had to be a substantial connection between the illegal activity and the property. So sort of this – like you were talking about fortuitous uses of, of property, that should not be a substantial connection. We were able to get good law established on that. In the Caswell cases, courts have generally been pretty good on that, although um, some courts have not been so good and that needs to be, that needs to be uh, 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 reinforced. Um, also thankfully, um, the Supreme Court but only in a five to four decision has said that the excessive fines clause of the Eighth Amendment applies to civil forfeiture um, and it's a multi-factored test that they use to try to determine that. So you're not supposed to have situations where you know you could lose your boat because there was pot residue in your in your uh, ashtray. Um, but those are hotly contested cases. There's a huge amount of law surrounding what might be considered an, an excessive um, amount of, of, of forfeiture. And is the reason they haven't gone – I mean like you could – I'm imagining it would be quite lucrative for a police department if they could somehow seize um, – one of the major Vegas hotels that's worth more than this, this little motel. But they is have the lawyers though. That's yeah, the is that the reason point. they haven't done it? That, they don't do it? Is absolutely. The I mean that's – they typically favor – I mean a lot of these little forfeitures add up. And, and you were saying too, like with $10,000, you take $6,000, you're right. A lawyer is not going to crack open a book for under $10,000 and people realize they have to either settle and a lot of forfeiture cases are in fact settled. And that's what the way most – if you make a fuss and you go to the government and you get a lawyer involved and pay the lawyer to do it, it, it the, the, oftentimes the prosecutors will say, all right, you know, let's stop fighting about this. We took 10000 We'll keep five. We'll give and you And that sounds five. like a great deal to you. Great deal. Yeah. I mean you know, it's outrageous. You haven't done anything wrong but you have to take it because you know you're going to quickly exceed the value of, 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 of the property. And that's one of the – you know, clearly – Every budget motel has these problems. We were able to show in the case that the Motel 6 right up the street from the Motel Caswell in Tewksbury had identical problems, some times even worse problems than the Motel Caswell. The parking lots of big box retail stores also are dens of criminal activity, especially low-level drug dealing. Um, they don't go after Walmart. They don't go after uh, Motel 6. They don't go after the Fairfield Inn. 
the reason for that is because they have to deal then with the big corporate law firms. Oftentimes, property, uh, commercial properties are heavily mortgaged, so you're going to have all these people in court saying, "We didn't do anything wrong. We want a piece of this. You know, if you sell it, we want our cut of it." The Motel Caswell was a family-owned, mortgaged-free business that was about a million and a half dollars on the open market. It was a big piece of property. Uh, it was commercially zoned, uh, so it was worth a lot of money, and um, that's why. The, the cops and, and, and the government wanted it um, and unlike even in, in eminent domain cases where at least the property owners get some compensation, it's rarely just compensation, you get nothing. So if Russ and his family would have lost this case, he would have been left with absolutely nothing except a big legal bill and that was his retirement. That's how most small businesses are. They retire, they sell the property and that's their pension. Well, if if part of the reason that the cops don't go after bigger players to seize their property is because they're afraid those people will end up in, will, are willing to take it to court and then they would lose, the cops would lose, then what does winning cases like this one accomplish? If you still, because you still are going to, even if if the courts say yes, they're not allowed to do this, and then they do it, you're still going to have to use the courts to say no you this was actually a violation of what we've said yeah, it, it's an, i mean it gives property owners weapons that that they have you know and it established precedents and this is the caswell case is a great precedent for property owners to use and ha they have used it it's been cited in several other uh, other cases and and certainly some property owners can fight uh, it one change in the law that occurred in in 2000 at the federal level is that you can now at least get attorney's fees if you're successful in fighting a forfeiture so that's that was a great change uh, in the law that at least incentivizes people to do it. But you're right. You know, even with great precedent, other changes have to be made and that's why we're working to change the law in a much more comprehensive way, not just through litigation, which is essential, but also through public awareness and activism and then ultimately legislative uh, uh, change then as well. And that's what we're doing in civil forfeiture right now. We started an initiative in 2010 to fight these laws, to raise public awareness of this, um, to do, of course, the, uh, the, the cutting edge litigation. We've issued several studies that um, document the problems with uh, civil forfeiture. Cato's also done great work in showing um, uh, the very real issues with civil forfeiture and they've been doing that for, uh, uh, for a number of years. And even in the last you know, six to seven months, We've seen this great wave of awareness and outrage building about civil forfeiture, which is leading hopefully to changes um, both in the behavior of law enforcement, which we've seen even in our cases with where they've been backing down um, and and returning property that they've unjustly that they've unjustly taken, and hopefully that will lead once again to really fundamental changes in the law. And just very recently, we saw Attorney General Holder make some announcements about reforming this. What did what is he changing? Right. Well, that was something that was a result, I think, of of all of the public pressure that's been building about this. As and I said, no small part by by Institute for Justice, because your your Philadelphia case, for example, I mean, yeah. there's been a lot of pressure. There's been a lot of pressure. We've been doing that. We have a class action in Philadelphia. We've been doing several cases against against the federal government. Uh, we've been working closely with reporters, and they have done great work. There was a whole series. In the Washington Post, document especially highway seizures of uh, of, of currency uh, and other sorts of, of property that led to that led to uh, serious concern and um, uh, pushback from also legislators uh, and, and the like. There was also it's gotten into popular culture, uh, and there was a great piece that. Um, probably you guys saw John with, Oliver, with John yeah, Oliver, which uh, yeah. it did. You know, a, basically a 15, 20 minute rant against civil forfeiture. That's now gotten, I think, the last time I checked, close to four million views on on YouTube. Again, raising awareness of that. It's one of these things where people hear about it and they say, "How could this possibly exist? How could they do this?" And so that's um, been been fantastic. So did Holder and, fix it? Uh, no, yeah. he did not fix it. Not, I mean, and there was some, unfortunately, some news reports that have said, "Oh, you know." It's Civil forfeiture is basically ended, or at least a certain type of civil forfeiture that's been ended. Now he did take, and we have to give him some credit, some credit for um, uh, for curtailing for the first time on his own. You know, for a law enforcement agency to curtail its own power is is pretty unusual. And so what uh, he did was that he uh, addressed a certain problem in the law called adoption. 
And that is when basically a local uh, police department might pull somebody over, seize a certain amount of currency and then because they'd rather have the feds do it because it's easier for them or they want to bypass potentially state laws that might give greater protections for property owners or might not allow the money to go back to the court, the cops, they will give it to the, the federal government will adopt – doesn't that sound great? It you know, sounds very, very pleasant. Adopt a forfeiture and, uh, and, uh, and continue on and, and the federal government keeps 20 percent, 80 percent goes back to state and local officials. So that was a good change but unfortunately that only addresses a certain problem and, um, and uh, we don't quite know the figures yet but um, uh, exact figures with it. But there was an exception in the law, in the, in the holder policy that allowed for the creation and and the ability to still do these types of seizures under joint state and local task forces. So as long as the feds and the states were working together, then they could still continue to engage in these types of seizures. And that is a big loophole and one that has to be closed. Now, the Justice Department has said this is not the first and this is not the last thing that they're going to be doing. This is just the first thing they're going to be doing. So hopefully there will be further steps for it. But it also – and what our concern is, is that it not be used as an excuse for Congress and other legislative officials to say, oh, problem solved. We don't have to do anything about this. They desperately have to do something about that and hopefully that will that will continue and, um, and we'll see more fundamental changes to the law. So this has been a, a – Interesting sort of tour between two parts of, uh, of dangerous to property rights, uh, including my elegant transition between including <laughs> yes, including that elegant transition. Are you optimistic going forward? You know, I, I am given um, what we've been. We're seeing even in the, as little as the last six months. Um, you know, we've seen great changes in the law in eminent domain, and that's been wonderful to see. I uh, but. As Jefferson once said and as I'm sure just about all of your listeners are, are aware of, eternal vigilance uh, is is the price and that you cannot just say, well, it looks like this problem solved. We can we can move on and 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 you know stop watching this. You have to stay on this uh, because these can be very fragile gains if if you're not out there always uh, making sure that uh, that uh, constitutional rights are protected. With what's happening in civil forfeiture, it's been very encouraging to see the movement on it, the momentum building. Now it's a question of what's going to change. I think you're seeing courts more willing to look at these seizures in the same way that courts after years of neglect started uh, looking more carefully at eminent domain takings uh, and you're seeing the public being concerned about this. Legislators now seeing that public pressure have said we've got to start taking a look at this. One encouraging thing too about this is that um, it seems to unite people across ideological divisions and you're seeing uh, Republicans, Democrats, certainly libertarians that are, are on board with uh, uh, with doing this. Um, but uh, it might be a, a, an opportunity to put together a true bipartisan effort that would actually be used to uh, curtail government rather than to curtail uh, liberty. So, um, so that's been very encouraging too. Um, the challenge of course is – what we also faced on eminent domain, we face here, which is a very powerful and very organized opposition to this as well. Law enforcement knows legislators very well. Legislators are very uh, afraid to be on the wrong side of law enforcement in, in political debates. And once you especially start talking about taking away funds, you're going to get a lot of pushback on this uh, too. So that's something that um, I don't think the battle has not been fully um, engaged yet on that. But the progress um, is, has been encouraging and we've just got to keep uh, the momentum going on this. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughts, P-O-D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more, you can find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.